For centuries, young men went to sea to go whaling, but I, I joined a ship to save whales. Ever since I was 14 years old, no environmental issue was of greater importance to me than the issue of whaling. It was a deeply held feeling anchored in the experience of seeing a photograph, this photograph, of a dead whale being consumed by an 8,000-ton factory whaling ship plying an Antarctic sanctuary, turning living marine mammals into stakes. I didn't know it then, but I would spend 10 years of my life chasing the ship that haunted my dreams as a teenager. Shortly after turning 18 years old, I learned that the Marine Conservation Group Sea Shepherd was outfitting a ship that was going to use direct action to physically intervene and stop the slaughter of whales. And I knew that I had to join that ship as crew. For over a month, I called the head office every single day, seriously. I'd call them on a Monday, to which they would reply, we'll get back to you on Wednesday. I'd call them on Tuesday to make sure that they were still going to call me on Wednesday, and on Wednesday, I would call them before they ever had a chance to reach me. Don't call us, we'll call you, they said. But after a month of relentless dialing, they relented, told me to pack my bags and join a ship that was heading to Iceland to save whales. We never made it to Iceland. Instead, I spent five and a half months as an oiler in the engine room, ankle deep in diesel sludge, cleaning out every single fuel tank on our ship as we were delayed by delay after mechanical delay. When the ship was finally ready to go to sea, the Icelandic whaling season was over, and so we headed to the Galapagos Islands to save sharks instead. We headed down to the Galapagos Islands to save these sharks. We'd only been in the Galapagos Marine Reserve for about a couple of hours until we came across our first illegal fishing long line a long monofilament line stretching out for miles and miles in every direction and sporting thousands of hooks set to catch sharks for their fins. We stopped our passage and immediately began to haul in all eight miles of illegal fishing gear. The crew were elated because finally we were taking direct action to save marine wildlife, but I remember feeling deflated. I knew that while we were busy with this necklace of death, other fishing vessels around the world were simultaneously deploying enough fishing longline to wrap around the circumference of the earth 500 times. And here we were, pulling up just eight miles. But my job that night was to stand on the forecastle deck where I cut the hooks free from the line that came up on deck, depositing those hooks in a bucket at my feet. And as the bucket slowly filled, I remember holding one of those hooks in my hand and watching it gleam under the moonlit night and thinking this one hook is not going to kill a shark or a sea turtle or a tuna that night. And though I'll, though I'll, although I joined this ship with this youthful naivety that I was setting off to sail the world, to save the world, what I learned is that one person can save the entire world for one individual. It's a lesson that I would relearn and relearn many times in my career. Eventually, I made it down to the Antarctic, where I spent a decade stalking Japanese whaling ships through an iceberg-littered seascape, hunting the whale hunters. I rose through the ranks, from an oiler cleaning out fuel tanks to captaining ships. And many years after seeing that photograph that had scarred my soul, I stood at the helm of my ship as my crew and I maneuvered between an oil tanker and that five-story tall floating slaughterhouse as we used our ship to try to prevent the ladder from refueling at sea. This specter of a ship that had obsessed me like an anti-Ahab, 
seemed a lot less wraith-like when its steel hull collided with mine, its anchor like a big black wrecking ball almost taking out my wheelhouse. But the young whale shepherds defeated the mighty iron Goliath by standing fast. We saved 932 whales that year when the whaling fleet, unable to refuel at sea, had to head back to port with less than 10% of their bogus self-allocated quota. When the International Court of Justice in The Hague ruled that the whaling program was illegal, the whalers took a one-year hiatus, giving us the opportunity to focus on a different poaching problem down in the Southern Ocean. I would learn that whaling was not the root problem facing the world's oceans. Rather, whaling was symptomatic of a more problematic relationship that we have with the oceans. The poaching of Patagonian and Antarctic toothfish used to be so extensive that one out of every three fish was caught illegally. Six vessels, which I would come to call the Bandit Six, were able to evade justice by changing their name and changing their flag constantly. An Australian Customs and Border Protection surveillance plane would fly over them, would document their illegal activity, and then as soon as that surveillance plane was over the horizon, the ship would already be operating under a new identity. The most notorious of the Bandit Six was Thunder. Thunder was a ship on several international blacklists. It was the subject of an international criminal police organization, Interpol, wanted notice that had made an illicit profit of over $60 million in its 10-year poaching career. Our idea for shutting down the Bandit Six for stopping Thunder was so simple that it had never been attempted before. We would try to track down Thunder in the most remote tract of water in the world, a shadow land more than two weeks sailing from the nearest port. On finding them, we would follow them wherever they went for however long it took until some government, any government, took over what amounted to a citizen's arrest. I fantasized about running down from my bridge down to the bow and having my photograph taken. Thunder in the background, me with their Interpol wanted notice in the foreground. As long as we doggedly pursued Thunder, biting at their heels, they couldn't simply change their color scheme with a new, freshly painted name on the stern. We would be this spotlight, lighting up their shadowy criminal enterprise, a veritable loud hailer exclaiming, this is where thunder is, right here, right now, somebody somewhere, arrest this ship. After just two days of searching, thunder emerged out of a fog bank that obscured the jagged line where ice met sea. Unbeknownst to me, the longest maritime chase in history had just begun. The first thing that the captain of Thunder tried to do was to lose us in the heavy ice flows that circumscribe the Antarctic continent, but I was able to follow by simply tracing the warm line that Thunder drew in the ice ahead of me. Once out of the ice, the Thunder headed north, steering for one of the severe storm systems that the Southern Ocean is renowned for. Six, seven, eight-meter seas beat and battered my boat Bob Barker as we climbed mountainous waves, bow into the howling wind. With calm restored off the Cape of Good Hope, Thunder shut down their engine in order to conserve fuel and try to just wait us out. We turned off our engine as well and settled into what we would later call the Great Drift. For weeks and weeks we drifted, staring at one another through binoculars across a blue no-man's land. One day, just after lunch, my chief engineer came up to the bridge and brought me my fuel figures for the day. And through some quick calculations, I was able to determine that if thunder drifted indefinitely, then we could be at sea for up to two years. I bounded down. From the bridge down to the galley, I grabbed my chief cook and I asked her, Priya, 
do we have enough food to stay out at sea for up to two years? And I will always remember her reply. She said, Peter, we have enough rice and we have enough beans to survive at sea for two years. After over a month of drifting, thunder finally started making way, rounding South Africa, steaming north past Namibia, Angola, the Democratic Republic of Congo, bit of a geography lesson here, Republic of Congo, Gabon, and then finally, after 110 days of pursuit across three oceans covering 11,000 nautical miles, the captain of thunder decided to sink his own ship in a bid to destroy the evidence on board. I remember standing on the bridge of my ship, watching thunder rear up like a wild Mustang, bow pointed at the heavens, before gravity dragged it down into the depths of a watery Hades. And I remember thinking, why? Out of all the places where the captain could have sunk his own ship, why did he choose the Gulf of Guinea? When we handed all 40 of the rescued crew over to the Sao Tome and Coast Guard, I noted that the Sao Tome and Coast Guard only had two small boats with a range limited to about a quarter of the distance to where Thunder now sat at the same depth as Titanic. The captain of Thunder knew that no Navy or Coast Guard was going to come out with submersible pumps to keep his ship afloat. He knew that his ship would sink and the evidence on board with it for the same reason why the Gulf of Guinea is a hotbed of illegal fishing, drug trafficking, human trafficking, and piracy, namely inadequate monitoring, control, and surveillance. It's before the chase of thunder, I, I was a whale guy, so I just, I knew nothing about fish. I thought, like most people, that uh, you could go offshore and just find fish anywhere. And yet what I would learn is that 90% of the world's fish is actually found in the waters of coastal states where there actually is a national authority with the jurisdiction to uphold the law. And that's critically important. Because when 20% of the global catch of fish is caught through illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, so-called IUU fishing, then we already have a lot of the laws in place to turn the tide on overfishing. It's difficult to imagine how bountiful the oceans once were because every generation has adapted to diminishment. When ships in the 1700s arrived off the Grand Banks of Newfoundland, they observed schools of cod so thick that a bucket thrown overboard could be hauled back up on deck, teeming with cod. Ship captains noted in their logbooks that there was so much fish that they could have almost walked ashore by just walking on the backs of cod. Ships would sometimes have to stop for a full 24 hours to allow for pods of dolphins and whales to pass their bow in whale traffic jams far worse than anything you could imagine, even here in terms of traffic in Athens. It's easy to dismiss these stories as apocryphal, but the reality is that there are so many independent accounts made by so many different ships that would have had no ability to communicate with one another that they're likely to be true. What should be normal seems like an, an exaggeration in an already emptied ocean. As I was chasing thunder up the west coast of Africa, I was in touch with a number of countries asking them if they could arrest thunder if thunder entered their waters. It was the central African country of Gabon that got back to me immediately and said that they would. Gabon is known for its 550 mile long, wild and unmolested coastline, but the country is famous for its surfing hippopotamuses. Gabon's surfing hippos spend most of their time on the beach. They'll swim out to sea using coastal currents to transport their gargantuan bodies up and down the shore, and then will just body surf back to shore. The wide expanse of Gabon's coastline, coupled with the fact that the government's economic resources are stretched, 
means that the government doesn't have the vessel assets to cover the entirety of their waters. So two months after Thunder sank, I traveled to Gabon and signed the first of eight public-private partnerships that we have with African coastal states to stop illegal fishing. And in the true spirit of cooperation and collaboration, we provide the ship, we provide the crew from oilers to captains, we provide the fuel, and our government partner provides the law enforcement agents, the Navy sailors, the fisheries inspectors, the national park rangers, the people with the authority to board, inspect, and arrest vessels. To date, we've assisted our government partners to arrest over 70 vessels for illegal fishing and other fisheries crime. Last year, I joined Gabon's Minister of Fisheries on a fisheries patrol off Libreville, Gabon's capital, where we boarded a shrimp trawler. And what the minister witnessed shocked him like the photograph of that dead whale disturbed me. When the net was brought up on deck, only 0.2% of the catch was shrimp. The other 99.8% was other marine creatures, most of whom were thrown overboard dead. It was the literal equivalent of killing tens of thousands of animals for one shrimp cocktail. The minister ordered for the vessel to be arrested. 20 years after pulling up my first long line in the Galapagos Islands, I stood on the deck of this arrested shrimp trawler and saw a fish frantically flopping around on deck, struggling to breathe, her gills no longer wet, before scooping her up in my arms and gently releasing her back out to sea. I watched her swim aft past the fishing net that now hung limply on the deck of the shrimp trawler. The great, it was great that we'd helped make this arrest, but I knew that there were still thousands of illegal fishing vessels still out there. Releasing that one fish was a reminder to myself that one person can still save the entire world, at least for one individual. It's easier to launder fish than it is to launder money. As long as one out of five fish is caught illegally, then every person who eats fish has unknowingly contributed to criminal operators through complicity. The majority of you will be as horrified as I am every time you see a photograph of a harpooned whale. And yet although Japan, Iceland, and Norway together kill over 3,000 whales annually for meat, over 300,000, a hundred times that many, whales and dolphins are killed every single year through fishing gear entanglement. There isn't a single commercial fishery in the world that deliberately targets sea turtles, and yet six out of seven species of sea turtle are either threatened or endangered, mostly from being caught in shrimp trawl nets. And we'll proudly boycott shark fin soup, happy to point an accusatory finger at the People's Republic of China because it's easy to boycott a product that never ends up on our restaurant tables. It's easy to boycott something that requires no lifestyle change of us. But make no mistake about it, every can of tuna sold finances the deaths of the countless sharks cocooned in fishing nets or impaled on fishing hooks. To me, marine creatures are not seafood, they are sea life. Thankfully, you don't have to chase fish poachers and whale poachers halfway around the world to save sea life. You can save the entire world for a whale or a sea turtle or a shark every time you sit down to have a meal. While we spent weeks and weeks drifting together with thunder, there was an opportunity for some of my crew to transfer over to our sister ship, which had just pulled in 72 kilometers of fishing net abandoned by thunder when we found them. They were now heading back to port to hand over that net as evidence to Interpol. I gathered my crew together, 
and I told them that if they stayed with me, they would have to be prepared to be out at sea for up to two years with no guarantee of outcome. We could follow thunder for two years, escort them into port, only to watch the authorities just let them go. We could follow thunder for a year, only to suffer a mechanical breakdown like an engine failure, and then watch thunder just disappear. The only guarantee was that every day that we were with Thunder, they could not poach a single toothfish. That alone had to be reason enough to stay the course. Out of 30 crew, all but four decided to stay. It's something that inspires me to this day. Save a life, save the world. It's something that you can do every single day. I can't think of a better way to spend a life. Thank you. Thank you.